By the early 80s, feminism had well and truly come of age, but was about to enter a second phase. Black women, working class women and disabled women felt that their oppressions had not been taken into account by the largely white middle class pioneers of the women's movement. This was the era of so-called identity politics. Calling yourself a feminist was no longer sufficient. I'm a working class black woman. Oh, I would have said speaking as a Jewish lesbian. I would always identify myself as a black lesbian. Oh, Lord, you couldn't be involved politically in the 80s and not get involved in identity politics. There was a points system. It varied a bit. You had to work out what the local points system was, like the local currency. But there was always a points system. All over the place, women were discovering that their grandmothers were Jewish and that they'd only found out on their deathbed, or that somebody was third-generation Irish and took it on as if they were still, you know, living in Kilkenny, eating potatoes and working on a farm. Hello, Pat. Hi. Yes, the diaries came in. Well, 2000... The Bible of the women's movement at the time was Spare Rib, a high-minded feminist magazine that had been set up by educated middle-class white women. But now the women at Spare Rib were forced to take on the new politics of identity. Um, I mean, are they talking about um, helpers in terms of helping, you know, like... We started the process of changing the collective from being all white to a mixed-race collective. Spare Rib was the first institution in the women's movement that consciously did that process and of course it was a very public institution. We more and more realise ourselves in Spare Rib that, that there are differences between women. That doesn't mean that we can't unite, that we can't fight for the same mm. things, but there are differences that we have to take account of and we have to pay attention to. When the first black women came onto Spare Rib I think they were in a very difficult position. I don't think we were so crude as to say, OK, you go and do all the stuff with black women, we'll carry on the way we are. But we did, I think, think simply by having them on the collective, it would make things better. And I don't think that anybody predicted that it would make things a hell of a lot worse. Spare Rib invited Linda Bellos to become the first black woman to join their all-white collective. What I found... Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, good women. I enjoy working with a lot of them. Not all of them, but I enjoy working with a lot. But what I found was that they used to do these things, that I used to call them feminist travel logs, in which somebody was going on holiday to somewhere for three weeks, and they wanted a commission to write. The stories were always the same, about smiling faces, you know, in the face of adversity. They were always the same patronising rubbish. And after a while, I started writing to say, back to them and say, no, we won't take a piece from you. However, if you're going to Nicaragua or South Africa or wherever, perhaps you would put us in contact with local women who can write for themselves. Then the letter would come back. They may not speak English. And I'd say, that's fine. We will have the material translated, but actually we want to hear from women in their own language, in their own words. We knew from letters that were coming from women who lived there that they desperately wanted an article written on women in El Salvador. They didn't have the time to write it. Most of them couldn't speak English. They really wanted this woman to write about their predicament, and she was being told she couldn't because she wasn't from El Salvador. Now, that was that is ridiculous. I think the sort of splits we saw on the collective um, were being echoed in women's meetings and activities, you know, up and down the UK. I, th I think that's true, but I think they were really intensified in Spare Rib because with the women, readership was, was very broad and people were continually writing into us and saying, you're not representing us. And you just put your head in your hands and say, well, who are we representing? And we didn't know how to deal with it as, as largely white feminist movement. We didn't know how to cope with that. And so we turned quite a lot on ourselves. <laughs> They suggested that we do an article um, on what it's like for blind women in the women's movement and um, particularly in the 
Sisters Against Zabermont were formed because we felt excluded by the women's movement. You know, we were pretty upfront about how we would challenge it. We would shout and scream. We would stand outside with pickets, uh, with, with you know, and placards. And uh, you know, we we did our fair share of denouncing of women and and groups who were not um, were not actually making things accessible for us. They always used to turn up at the feminist book fairs and say, "We can't get in." And yeah, um, did, were you supportive of that? Is this, uh, is this off the record? I can't remember. I just remember they used to sit outside in their wheelchairs and be a bit sort of threatening. Well, I think like a lot of black women, uh, disabled women suddenly got a voice and got power by virtue of the fact that they were disabled. And if you weren't disabled, just like white women couldn't, you did not say a damn word when a disabled woman spoke. That was that. It was quite aggressive uh, and it was very hysterical and very emotional. Now, I would defend the hysteria and emotion because to be excluded is not nice. If it wasn't one thing and it was, it was another, I mean, if it wasn't disabled women feeling they were excluded, it was working class women feeling they were excluded. And you just felt, why am I doing this if I'm just going to get bullied? Because that's what it felt like. In the end, it felt like bullying and harassment. Identity politics were used by some people as a way to shut others up or for them to gain power. I mean, this will always happen. And it was not, in the end, positive. I can't think of anything good to say. There is something sort of Lord of the Flies-ish about it. <laughs> it was, in a, it, it became quite sinister. It was a bit Lord of the Fliesy, and it was a bit like, I mean, I've used the word fundamentalisms. It was a bit like a bit of a cult, where cult members end up sort of, you know, excluding each other or killing each other or, you know, just sort of turning on and turning on and turning on each other. Z until there's only you left.